Gotta dim it a little more. Hello world of YouTube and welcome to the second part of the first session of... Expectations. Reality. Where I take three games from my collection that I haven't played, sitting down and discussing my anticipation for each game before playing them, before following that up with a review of each game months later. And this is the reality portion where I will review the three games that I played. Now I'm filming each review separate so that way I don't lose any thoughts or everything that I'm talking about feels a little fresh because I'm not playing them all at the same time. Like I've dipped into Bayonetta a little bit and I've beat the game I'm gonna be talking about first and I wanna keep my thoughts in order when discussing each game, so that's why I'm going to be doing it. Now, if you missed the first half, the expectation portion, where I set up Turok 3, Beautiful Joe 2, and Bayonetta, feel free to check it out. It's linked in the description. And the first game that I beat was Turok 3, which wasn't really as good as I was hoping it would be. You know, I really, I really love Turok 2. And I really like Turok 1. I think Turok 1's a little flawed, but Turok 2 is a really fun game. It's got a well-established uh, set of rules, and I think that it gets just the right amount of nuts that Turok 3 does not follow up with in as many gratifying as I would have hoped circumstances. There is one big improvement on Turok 3 that they made above the other Turok games, and that's saving. They allow you to save at any time in Turok 3, which is fucking dope. And I think that it, it helps make the game a little more of a gratifying experience because you don't have to keep playing until you get to the next save pyramid like you had to in Turok 2, you know. Um, but everything else aside from that, I'm not too keen on. I actually think the graphics look a little worse than they did, did in Turok 2. I think that the cutscenes, while I get that they're trying to make something a little next gen, this is that weird point where they haven't nailed down yet and the character models are fucking terrifying. I think that the weapon design isn't as creative, the level design isn't as creative either. I get that even in the first Turok, you're shooting bad guys, but the second mission of this game is just stopping missiles from launching and shooting bad guys in like science fiction armor. It felt like I was playing Perfect Dark for the first couple of levels of this game. It didn't feel anything like a Turok game at all. It was a really weird experience. I don't think they did enough with the gadgets. Like they had a whole sub wheel of gadgets, but there's only two. One of which you unlock once you get all of these hidden pieces that are scattered throughout each level. The soundtrack was incredibly stock and generic and there was plenty of instances where it felt like there was like false tension going on for the sake of dramatics and it, it didn't enhance my gaming experience whatsoever. I like the idea of a character select, picking one of two characters, playing through the same story but they handle differently. But I picked Danielle. Um, I think that she was the better option personally. Um, I think that the game is it felt a little too short. Like I know that none of the Turok games are super long but this felt like such a breezy experience. I beat this in like three sittings. And my co I don't know if it's just my copy or my N64, but my game kept crashing so fucking much, like at key points and levels, to the point where I said fuck it and would use cheats to get to back to where I was because another thing that happened, which is totally my, my fault, my N64 memory card was corrupted. So I had to keep warping to levels that I left off at, and then say the game crashed midway through the level, I looked up the invincibility cheat and used it to get to back to where I was. It was a frustrating experience, sitting there, plugging in through a level for like the fifth time, having to only have it crash minutes after getting to where I was. It was a very frustrating experience. And I know that the, the memory card is my fault, the game crashing, that's probably not my fault. This game felt more cobbled together, you know. I don't think the character models, even the ones outside of cutscenes, looked as good as they did in the last couple of games. I think that the lore diving in was really neat. I liked the diving into the lore a lot more of Turok, establishing more about the lineage and all that sort of stuff, but 
the shit, the other shit they introduced is just not cool. The one level I thought was really cool was um, the the third level when it's kind of like a fever dream hellscape. It kind of reminded me of the darkness a little bit. That was a cool level, and I actually got to fight dinosaurs, which was also kind of nice to see. Um, and the fourth, the beginning of the fourth level was also really cool because it reminded me of the first Turok game. But then everything after that just felt like a lesser version of that. You know, down to, again, the enemy placement, enemy design, weapon usage. It just felt like a lesser version of the other games. And it was kind of disappointing because I had high hopes for this game. Because like I said, I, I adore these three games. Like, Rage Wars is a lot more batshit than Turok 3 is. And it's just a Quake clone. The gun weapon choices were, were a lot better and it was just a it was a better game and these just felt better narratively than Turok 3 did. Turok 3 just felt like a mess. Its ending was fucking terrible too. The entire last level was a nightmare because I kept running out of fucking ammo and had to use my razor blade gun that I or my razor blade that had infinite ammo was like an insta kill weapon. The, the whole last level of the game was just a massive disappointment to me. The end of that game is so bad and they were trying so hard to set up a fourth game that they didn't get because the next game in the franchise was a prequel and then they rebooted the series so that was kind of unfortunate um so yeah i i, I mean out of 10 what would i rate this game i'd give it like a like a three maybe a maybe a maybe a maybe a three maybe a three i'm not going any higher than that it's pretty bad you know it's 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 pretty shitty is unfortunate let's talk about a different game you ever play a game where there's a stark contrast between how the game looks in the cutscenes like the characters actions and cutscenes versus how it actually is in the game and it can be a little frustrating Bayonetta is not that game whatsoever while yes the cutscenes are fucking nuts you pretty much get to do everything that happens in the cutscenes at some point in the game you want to ride a bike up a rocket ship, you get to do that. You want to run along walls in a village while lava consumes the village while you're dodging debris and angels are surrounding you on all sides, you get to do that. You want to fight in a church that then becomes a fight in the air while you're still in the church and a dragon's head is stuck in the church, you get to do that. There's just, there's a level of insanity in this game that I was expecting, but was still exceeded tenfold. Like, the amount of interesting boss fights you get to do, take part in in this game is insane. The presentation of this game is just all around perfect. I love the way this game presents itself. I love the way, I love how stylish this game is. I love that there's a lot of nuance to its presentation as well. Like. It's not just all bombast. I love the little touches, like how fights with enemies, like even regardless of your bosses or not, are called verses to a song. It's very musically uh, influenced as far as this presentation is considered. Um, I love that whenever you get weapon upgrades are in the form of vinyl records, I think that that's really cool. It stays classy, like the soundtrack fits its elegance and sleekness that the presentation has. And I really like that. I love the soundtrack of this game. It's so cool. I love the, the main themes that play when you're fighting enemies or the, the climax music at the end of a boss fight. It's, it's awesome. It's really, really awesome. And I like how fluid a lot of the combat felt in this game. And I like how the game, the way the game decided to integrate combat into a bunch of different types of gameplay. I love the cutscenes, I love how comedic this game is. This game is hilarious. Fuck me. Um, had me chuckle in handful of times throughout throughout my, my tenure with it. I also really fucking love this in-between levels minigame angel attack. It's a nice little minigame to master that's also kind of challenging. You get your power-ups. That's really some of the highest praises I can give this game, or its presentation, its story. You know, for how batshit this game is, the story isn't too hard to follow, which I think is a, is a, is a detriment to that if you're going to make a game that's really insane like this. Its story should not be hard to, to get a hold of, and I like that this isn't that. I also really like the characters. I love Ronin, the weapon maker, his little lackey sidekick. 
um, Laka, one of the guys that you meet along the way, and there's a lot of other characters that come across that you meet as the game progresses that are really fun as well. Um, my biggest complaints with the game, honestly, because this game isn't perfect. It's it's pretty fucking good, but my issues with the game stem with the actual game itself. Um, while I do like a lot of the boss fights, I hate that they are reused, um, especially by the end of the game. You fight a lot of the same bosses in less as cool instances, with the exception of a couple. There's a couple bosses that you fight again in just as cool a ways as you did the first time. Um, especially there's this one boss near the end of the game that you fight in a boat that you then fight in a completely different environment and it's really cool what they did there. And also the, the language of the game, like how the game teaches a player, or how a game lets the player progress. So one of the things that I even talked about in my expectations portion is that I figured this game was going to be a do another of the... The spiritual successor to Devil May Cry, it's something I've been told a lot, and as a huge fan of those games, I was excited to play this. I still felt like the, the way this game let the player progress and level up, the learning curve of this game, if you will, was a little too steep, even for someone who's, who's played a lot of those games. And that might fall on myself as a gamer, this might be the point where I become a gaming journalist reviewer type person, but I feel like the, the learning curve of this game was just a little too steep. I unlocked a weapon that I wasn't able to actually purchase until like four levels later because they are so stringent with how you get halos. It all has to do with how well you play the game. And while the combat is fun and fluid and, and, and easy to get a hold of, it's really hard to master. Granted, by the end of the game, I was doing really well. I felt like it took a lot longer to get to that point than I was hoping for. In a game like this and I was playing on like the, the normal difficulty I wasn't playing on like the hardest difficulty and that was my issue with it as far as that's concerned there's also a mechanic that they really hammer home as kind of essential to combat and doing well in combat early on and that's the which time the bullet which the, the, the type of combat that slows the, uh, the mechanic that slows time down and allows you to really hit enemies and early on in the game they kind of introduced it as a thing that triggers every time you dodge an attack. You even get power-ups that are supposed to instantly trigger this bullet witch time um, the minute you activate them. Yet, by the end of the game, I was activating these, or not even by the end of the game, like near the end of the game, like in the third act, that bullet witch time was not always acting in the way that it did previously. Um, in particular, in, in level 10, there was a moment where I was fighting uh, this mini boss that I had already fought like five times up to this point um, And I was dodging attacks like I had before But it wasn't activating and it was very frustrating because it made that fight a lot harder because in the initial fight and in all the fights leading up to this one titular fight um, it, it was kind of essential to, to doing a lot of damage to the enemies without having to weave around them and do chip damage to them essentially which is what I ended up having to do or um, using power-ups which then lower your score and lower the amount of halos you get to use special attacks to fight, beat them easier and I felt like they should have conveyed at some point in the game or the story that your bullet witch wasn't as strong as it used to be because it never did that and it was a little frustrating <clears throat> And speaking of which, especially the two, two clawed boss, I fought those dudes so many times. And that was the biggest instance of them reusing a type of boss. And there were other ones that they reused, but I felt like those were supposed to be like smaller bosses that were going to be more like lackeys later on. And these two were introduced pretty in the middle of the game, and yet they became like a, an immediate reoccurring boss. And it was kind of frustrating, and it was kind of, it was kind of unfortunate because they were a fun boss to fight. But the the fact that I saw them so much by the end of the game, I was already sick of seeing them after like the sixth, seventh time I played them. It didn't help that those bullet witch mechanics were weren't working the way that they should. And it's stuff like that that just I feel like kind of weighed the game down for me. With a special fuck you going to this kinship segment, if you are not fully prepared for it. You get your ass handed to you time and time again, and it is pretty goddamn infuriating. Outside of those those nitpicks, this is a really great game. If for some reason you haven't picked up Bayonetta 1 or haven't played it, you owe it to yourself to do so. It's really fun. It's really tongue-in-cheek. I love the way the game 
presents itself, and I love a lot of the things within this game. I just wish that the game conveyed itself a little better as far as how to master it. Because I feel like <clears throat> if you weren't familiar with the other games that kind of were in the same vein before it, you might have an even harder time mastering this game. And that, that maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just me reading into things. But that's how I felt walking away from it. I also don't know how they would continue the story, which is why I'm, I'm even more intrigued to play Bayonetta 2, because, like, this game felt like a really whole experience. Like, I don't feel the urge to see what happens next. I felt like it's a nice, full story. So I'm curious to see what they do next, but that won't happen for a while, because I don't have a Switch. I mean, if I were to rate this game, I'd give it, like, an 8 out of 10. It was really fun. Um, by the end of the game, I was still, even while they were reusing some bosses, they were still presenting new bosses in a fresh way and the ways that I fought them were really cool and yeah even the levels the even even the levels because by the end of the game they were kind of hammering bosses as a level but they had levels in between that that were just bad shit nuts uh and it's shit like that that really that really spices up this game and makes it a more fun experience um in spite of some of its uh, basic shortcomings uh, but that's my take the let's 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 spin into the the final game in this session Beautiful Joe 2 feels like the right kind of sequel Beautiful Joe deserved, but it still has its shortcomings that set it apart in, as a more derivative form of its predecessor. This game has a lot of ideas in it, and I think that it's very ambitious. It's a little more ambitious than the first Beautiful Joe, both in story, scope, and level design, but I feel like its shortcomings stem from a lack of direction on where to take some of those new additions. Um, again, this game this game is really, really solid. It's got a lot of really good ideas in it. The comedy is still really, really sharp, and some of the writing and cutscenes are hilarious. Hey, 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 wait up there. That's the old script. Ha! I must admit, Joe. You are a worthy rival. The use of a recurring character as a mini-boss after you fight him the first time is a motif they explore in later games of theirs, but I feel like it's done really well in this Genesis. I think a lot of the puzzles are really challenging in a nice way and in a fresh way to me personally. I like the puzzles in this game and the way that they use the mechanics from Beautiful Joe 1 and the addition of Sylvia and her mechanics work really, really well. I just feel like there were some of those ideas that didn't fully come together in some levels. Um, namely with Sylvia. I like Sylvia a lot. I think she's a really nice addition to the game, but I feel like I didn't utilize her as much as I would have liked outside of puzzles because she is more used as pieces of a Swiss army knife, so to speak, with her new abilities, her gun and stuff, and I felt like I was switching to her more often than not because I was out of options more than I felt like I needed to use her in this scenario, which was upsetting. Um, a big level where that's the case is the submarine level. Even if I just had a showcase of, like, Sylvia getting into a drill instead of a sub like Joe, that would, you know, help the player see that you will use her as much as you will Joe in this level. Um, I like the variety of some of the levels as well. I like that they bring some not just straightforward platforming levels, which is something they did in Beautiful Joe 1, but I like the continuation of them here. Um, I do like a lot of the boss fights. I think that some of them are needlessly challenging, but a lot of them are challenging in all the right ways. Um, and I feel like by the end of the game, I had a good grasp on how the game wanted me to tackle things like bosses as far as the strategy to, to, to weaken them and stuff like that. Um, I will say, by the end of the game though, this this crawl became a bit of a chore as far, especially with the last level of the game. The, to get to the last boss is just needlessly monotonous and they put you against enemies that intentionally, I feel like, take more hits just to elongate the experience, and that's a little upsetting. But outside of that, and the final boss being nice and actually having a use for Sylvia, this game was solid. I mean, it was a nice 
little romp. My expectations were pretty much met with this. I feel like they... I came in expecting a game that was a little more put together as far as the mechanics. There's a little more expansion on the mechanics from one with a bit of a funnier story. The story in this game is more absurd, which I was hoping for, and it met that pretty well. And the gameplay, for the most part, still feels really, really tight. Um, again, the only shortcomings are I felt like I didn't utilize half of my tools as much as I would have liked. But maybe that's just a personal thing. Um, I do give this thing like a 7 out of 10. This game is like a 7 out of 10 game. It's a solid game. Um, there's a lot of extras you can unlock as well that I feel like are a really fresh thing in an age where unlocking things like that is not the tradition anymore. I like that there was a lot of bonus stuff to kind of sink your teeth into. And I didn't sink my teeth into really much of it, but that was more, that's more for me to do in my, in my spare time, possibly. Maybe for a stream. I don't know. But... I did. I did enjoy this experience, and it, and it met my expectations pretty pretty well. And that's going to be this segment. That's going to be expectations reality. Hopefully, this segment makes sense. Hopefully, you enjoyed this first episode of it, this first second part of the two-part episode. The next one, the second session, will actually be starting this week on Thursday. I have three games already picked. I already have the expectations video filmed ready to go. I haven't touched the games yet because I was wanting to finish these three, but if you would like to make a suggestion for an addition to the segment, feel free to leave it in the comments below. I do have a link to my game collection with the only the games I haven't played on there in the description. Um, let me know what you think of the segment, what things you can think I could do to retool it. Like I said, I feel like this, this segment's going to become more fully realized once I start streaming. I can pull specific notes from the streams put them into this, all that sort of stuff, but I'm going to go, that's going to be it, um, thank you for watching, I've been Viral Rack, you guys are good to situations, and I'll see you another day.